Welcome to the chaos sector. Want to make sure that we all understand the trial and the problems the prosecution will face. First, we have to align all the information into categories for clarity in how the trial will unfold. Evidence. The evidence against the defendant is DNA, which was reported to be discovered on a knife sheath in the victim's bedroom. That's the primary evidence the prosecution has, and generally speaking, it is the most damaging against a defendant. I would include the surveillance footage as evidence, but it hasn't been proven to exist. The Linda Lane surveillance was edited. Simple as that. No surveillance from the neighbor's security camera. And that indicates there is no actual evidence of Koberger in that neighborhood. Think about this. If the Linda Lane surveillance showed a white Hyundai Elantra, even the 2011 to 2013 model, it would have been officially released by Moscow PD to the mainstream media. Yet, that surveillance was so-called leaked out approximately seven to eight months after Moscow PD identified a white Hyundai Elantra as a potential suspect. Again, we just kept drilling this home to prove that the Linda Lane surveillance was edited to convince the public. Koberger was not only there, but also guilty of the murders. Without this evidence, which is visual evidence, the DNA is the only so-called empirical evidence against the defendant. Speculation. Now, this is where things got very fuzzy. First, the claim Koberger stalked those housemates. It has never been confirmed, but many reports claim there was digital evidence that proved Koberger stalked those housemates. Similar to the neighbor's security camera footage, if there was evidence, it would have been proven. Then there is the claim that Koberger had been in that neighborhood 12 times prior to the murders. Mind you, they claim Koberger was seen, yes, he was seen, in the neighborhood 12 times prior, which means once again, there would be surveillance footage capturing his vehicle. Nothing has been released showing this so-called evidence. If it is reported by the mainstream media, then it went through a vetting process. In other words, some sort of investigator who looked into this had confirmed it existed. They examined surveillance, claimed he was there, and then it became evidence reported by the mainstream media. Cutting to the chase, the so-called private investigator claimed this. Law enforcement allowed it to be claimed publicly just like the prosecution, and it was nothing more than a lie to justify the arrest. How about the claim that Koberger was at Albertson's, shopping? The manager spotted him, apparently. This surveillance was given to Moscow PD, and yet it was never released to the mainstream media. Why is this person not being shown in any form of visual evidence linked to the murders which they are being charged for? That does not happen if that person was guilty and also spotted on camera there would be tons of video footage released to the mainstream media showing the guilty party. The various claims from so-called friends that Koberger was a drug addict and even sexually harassed a woman on a Tinder date. This was an attempt to justify Koberger as a stalker of those housemates, rooted in the classic insecure creeper who became obsessed with one of those girls, if not many of them. Nothing was proven. Again, law enforcement and the prosecution never came out and claimed it was merely speculation because they wanted that narrative to be pushed publicly while Koberger was in custody. And lastly, oh my fucking, the friend's home invasion. I mean, this was absolutely insanity. Mainstream media reported that Koberger had broken into his female friend's home. Wow. Yet, he was never arrested for this crime, but somehow he was identified as the home invader by, uh, well, it would have to be law enforcement. But guess who claimed this? A quote, source. That source is once again a private investigator who is lurking around literally creating all of this madness. Again, law enforcement and the prosecution never publicly stated this. So-called evidence has never been confirmed. So they allowed all of this to be speculated all throughout last year, instead of keeping the mainstream media from pushing speculation. Which creates a double standard now, because they never stopped the speculation of claims against Koberger from being spread throughout mainstream media. Yes, law enforcement and even the judge can prevent mainstream media from reporting on speculations about Koberger. Here's another reason why they should have done that, if they were actually honest. Law enforcement in particular would have to prevent that speculation, because it essentially develops evidence that Moscow PD has, you understand? Yet they don't have it, so they can't allow mainstream media to indirectly misrepresent the evidence they have collected. Moscow PD did address the speculation that Kaylee was being stalked, but this was before, yes, before Koberger came about. But when Koberger became the actual person charged with the crime, Moscow PD never publicly came out and refuted the claims that Koberger was the stalker.
so when News Nation, Law and Crime, and others such as Old Hag Grace were claiming this as fact, it convinced the public that Moscow PD had that evidence. Remember, they claimed there was digital evidence that proved Koberger was stalking one of those housemates. If they claim there was digital evidence, then where do you think that ends up? In the evidence locker, the digital one. The public would assume there is evidence Koberger stalked the housemates, and what do you think this does? It means there is a motive, and there is DNA at the home the night of the murders. Put it this way, to really grasp it. Moscow PD has a media team, okay? So their media team is literally watching the mainstream media report that there is digital evidence that Koberger stalked those housemates. Now, what would be the genuine and professional thing to do here? Chief Fry holds a press conference, informing the public that the claims about the suspect have not been confirmed, and we do not have any evidence at this point regarding the suspect stalking any of the victims. What this does is prevent this so-called source from lurking around making these claims, and then the mainstream media regurgitating it as a fact. Old hag Grace can't spew her venom to her audience about Koberger stalking those housemates. Bill Thompson, so-called correcting the surveyor about speculation, is what they were supposed to do about that very speculation long time ago. It did its job, and now it's all starting to crumble before the prosecution's eyes. The judge can only order gags for so long. At some point, the evidence would have been released, and the only thing left would be the sentencing. On the flip side, the endless gag orders were to drag the trial on and on, hoping there will somehow be a plea bargain from the defense. See, the judge is also in cahoots with the prosecution and the state, it's obvious. Every time Ann Taylor filed a motion, the judge denied it or, quote, delayed the proceedings. Going back to the preliminary hearing, once again, the preliminary hearing was quashed to prevent the defense from challenging the evidence the prosecution claims to have, which is the DNA. If anyone recalls, Koberger stated the DNA was not his DNA. Ann Taylor stated her client had no relation to those victims, and one of the housemates, Bethany Funk, had exculpatory evidence to exonerate Koberger of all the charges against him. But of course, all of this was shut down, and Koberger was indicted by a grand jury. Ann Taylor filed an appeal to the indictment, and of course the judge denied it. Bethany Funk's attorney prevented her from meeting with the defense. Now why would that attorney do this? Oh, because she was traumatized, and the attorney didn't want her to be involved. But she is involved. She was a fucking surviving housemate, right? If she met with the defense, she would provide a statement, signed and sealed, and even if she didn't testify, her statement with her signature would still be exculpatory. But it would be even more damaging if she was physically in court, on the stand testifying. That's why they quickly shut down the preliminary hearing, because this gave the defense the opportunity to summon Bethany for her testimony. Are you guys following so far? Now, does anyone believe Koberger would have a fair trial with all of this fuckery? This is why there needs to be a change of venue and a new jury pool. So what evidence does the prosecution actually have? Nothing. Oh, wait, they have the DNA, right? Nope. Gabriella Vargas already exposed the truth, and Bill Thompson told the FBI to go pay her a visit. Let's listen to how such a nefarious action is performed. So initially, if I put in my, my subject's DNA in the system, I don't know who it belongs to, I put their kit number in. You get a kit number after you upload the data, okay? I put the kit number in. I run a tool called One to Many, and it's going to show the top 500 matches that this subject has. I then would go to utilize the manipulation tool, the loophole, you would then go click the top match and run their matches. And throw the top match of your subject's top match. You would run their matches. Okay. Once you run their matches, there is a tool that allows you to edit that list of matches. So we're looking at the matches of the subject's top relative, not the subject's matches, right? When you edit the kit list, if you put the subject's kit number into this tool that you're going to now analyze, the, these matches, it tricks the system and allows you to see matches that you wouldn't have seen if you ran your initial match list. Okay, there's the red flag, of course. Vargas just stated that there is a loophole in the genealogy testing that allows you to edit data in association to the subject. 
Well, immediately, we can't help but think this is why the prosecution was so evasive in providing the defense the actual source and process of how they obtained Koberger's DNA. Let's continue. And those can be people that did not agree with law enforcement to see their DNA. Those matches that are revealed are only matches that are, have been opted out. Because that is the only one that is open. They're only the ones. If, so if you see that the subject matches one of these people, because again, you're not looking at your subject's matches. You're looking at that person's top cousin, let's say, that top cousin's matches, right? When you put your subject's kit number in there, you're gonna see now his kit, her kit, compared against the matches of their top match. When you find, you, you then scroll down and you look, oh, here's a match for 100 Santa Morgans. You go back to your screen where you have your list of your subject matches and you say, I don't have a match with 100 Santa Morgans. That proves that that person has opted out of law enforcement matching, but I'm still able to see them. And so that, that's a way to use the tool to get past what law enforcement is supposed to do. It, I struggle with this. I'm sorry. Um, it, it is a, a tool that is provided in the database that essentially allows you to see things that you're not supposed to see. And as a result of seeing those things, you are then using that match to find who, yeah, to, to identify your subject. So you're violating the terms of service uh, by, by seeing these matches. Now, of course, this is where she started to reveal secrets that were, in fact, illegal. But we don't focus on her and the illegal activity she may have done in the past. We focus on the actual illegal activity or loophole that was used to identify, oh no, you can't just disregard her like that. She loses credibility if she's committing illegal activity, right? Well, we're going to disregard her potential illegal activity because she is not the focus. Outside of the subject at hand, which is Koberger, well, she may be potentially committing illegal activity. But it's not about her. It's about her knowledge of genealogy testing. And furthermore, it is not proven that Vargas actually uses that loophole. More than likely she has done it, but we're concerned about how Koberger's DNA was collected, and she explained how matches can be altered to match a specific subject, which would be the defendant in this case. Many would say that's why Thompson had the FBI visit her, due to this illegal activity. Well, it's apples and oranges or apples and tomatoes. Actually, what would be the difference from Vargas and the so-called informant the prosecution has? They would obviously be a criminal, yet they're using them for their information, right? But what did the FBI speak to her about, her testimony? If so, what in her testimony warranted a visit from the FBI? Because if it's her testimony, which was about the process of obtaining a match for someone's DNA, wouldn't the prosecution just cross-examine her about the, quote, inconsistencies or contradictions? Of course. So for the FBI to be sent to Vargas personally at her home indicates that the testimony was too revealing in how one could essentially manufacture a genetic match, which is what the FBI, yes, that damn FBI did in this investigation. Mind you, the FBI were the ones overseeing the process of obtaining a DNA match to Koberger. We know they paid her a visit due to exposing that loophole because this is how they matched the DNA to the knife sheath, meaning in an actual genealogy report showing the statistical data, it would show the so-called genetic match of the DNA obtained, or so-called collected, would match Koberger's DNA. Yep, we need to go pay her a visit before this really becomes a reality. None of the speculation, of course, has been verified, and what has been allegedly verified in being the DNA is actually manufactured evidence. It's one of the biggest frames in the history of criminal cases. It was the FBI who had denied tracking Koberger, instructing Indiana State Police to stop him on his travel to Pennsylvania. But one of their own suggested they did do such, you know, without literally claiming it, we read between the lines. He said something like, it's common for the FBI to track a suspect and have local and state authorities keep an eye on them. So I believe they did track Koberger. 
He said it, but didn't say it at the same time, so we all know the FBI is behind all of the fuckery. And, unfortunately, for the prosecution and also Moscow PD as always, the FBI returns back to the shadows after doing their dirty deeds, and you're left trying to figure out how the hell you'll get out of the mess. Oh yeah, see, the FBI will not be a primary focus in trial, and they work so cunningly that even with their dirty deeds in this case, they are not directly to blame for the frame. You see, it falls on Moscow PD and the prosecution. The FBI sneaks out the back door. Heck, even the private investigator who manufactured all of the so-called evidence against Koberger, well, it will be deemed speculation. The mainstream media will also sneak out the back door. Everyone who contributed to the public image of Koberger being the killer will all sneak out the back door, with no accountability whatsoever. And the only ones left are the prosecution and Moscow PD. The small town of Moscow should have just accepted the massacre as it was and sought justice the right way instead of trying to avoid having a negative image as a town. Crimes happen. Crimes happen everywhere. Just accept it. But they couldn't. They didn't want the college kids running around scared and moving out of town. Life happens, man. Just live with it. If you stand strong and fight for justice, real justice, those college students would see Moscow as a town of fighters, standing united, not willing to fold in fear against a threat. Ironically, those college kids will still run away because they see a friend's death could lead to someone being framed for that death. And what if they also knew the person who was being framed? Get out of Moscow quickly. This is the chaos sector.